Welcome to NAC TV Reads the News. My name is Gwen Jacobson and I'm one of many volunteers that help create programming for our station. NAC TV can be seen on MTS channel 30 or 1030, Westman Cable channel 17, Bell Satellite channel 592, or online at nactv.tv. These programs are made possible by our volunteers, staff, advertisers, as well as donations made by you, the viewers. If you are enjoying your NAC TV experience, please consider supporting us by either donation or volunteering. You can contact our office at 204-476-2639 or at nactv at wcgwave.ca. All right, this week's edition of the Nipua Banner and Press is dated Friday, April the 12th, 2024. Now on the front page, everyone knows that we had a partial eclipse passing through Manitoba. And we have a few pictures uh, showing it. This is what it looked like from here. On Monday, April the 8th, a rare and awe-inspiring celestial event traveled across North America in the form of a solar eclipse. Most of Manitoba, including Nipua, were only able to see a partial portion. Around 55% coverage on average of the moon passed over the sun, but it was still an amazing experience for many. The town of Nipua staged a viewing event at the flats, distributing glasses to people to see it for themselves. This is the first eclipse Manitoba has experienced since February of 1979. Wow, that's 45 years ago. And there's some additional pictures on this page. Here you can see the people wearing those special glasses and looking up at the moon, at the sun. Uh, so here, the eclipse was a spectacle to be seen on Monday, April the 8th. Here we see intrigued individuals gathered to get viewing glasses while they were still available and a cup of coffee as well. A supply of glasses was sold out in the first four minutes after being made available. And here, seen here are some photos showcasing the progression of the eclipse in which the moon would cover approximately 55% on average of the sun from the perspective of the community of Nipua. In 1979, this community and others in our coverage area fell lucky having been directly in the path for a total eclipse. The first photo here shows the progress progress of the eclipse in comparison to the photo on page one which depicted the moon and sun towards the start of the eclipse event. The bottom photo here showcases the eclipse towards its totality. So this was what it looked like at the beginning of the eclipse and then this is what it looked like as it progressed. All right. A trip down memory lane, Manitoba historians seek recreation of Sunshine Highway Trek by Casper Werhan. Have you ever heard of the Sunshine Highway? The answer to that question may be a coin toss, but if you haven't, you wouldn't be alone. This is something that a group of Manitoba history enthusiasts are hoping to change. As part of this, Alan Melvin and fellow committee members Charlie Baldock, Bill Sandercock, Mike Weber, volunteer printer and tour guide at the Crystal City Printing Museum, and Dr. Gordon Goldsboro of the Manitoba Historical Society, they are organizing a relic run for July the 23rd. I had been looking for more information on the Sunshine Highway initially, said Melvin, noting that this is what connected him and his fellow committee members. And Mike, it had turned out, 
he'd been researching the highway for some time and had found a good bit of information on it from old papers, even a route book from 1923. The materials found showed that the Sunshine Highway once stretched from Sioux City, Iowa, USA to Brandon, Manitoba, Canada. The Canadian portion of the International Highway passed through locations such as Crystal City, Glenora, Balder, Glenborough, Wamanisa, and Rountwaite before coming to a stop in Brandon. Organization for the highway had originally begun in Woonsocket, South Dakota in the spring of 1916. The outlined stretch of roads from the USA through Canada made the highway a total of 700 miles in length with hopes to expand. This hoped for expansion would include areas in Mexico, thus making it an international thoroughfare. However, it is unknown if the expansion occurred. Roads included in the Sunshine Highway were marked with signs featuring an S enclosed in a circle. Additionally, an R or an L would be featured above the encircled S to signify a right or left turn if you wish to stay on that particular highway. The official opening of the Sunshine Highway took place in Crystal City on July 23, 1921. Mayor Dinsdale of Brandon, along with Mayor Dalton of Woonsocket, South Dakota, also Sunshine Highway President, and 75 other highway officials were in attendance for the proceedings. This ceremonial day included a drive from Crystal City to Brandon. That's why we chose that date for our drive. It coincides with the original event. Now we're looking for people with older cars or trucks, 1940s or older, to take part in it with us. We don't want to potentially clog the roadways though, so we're limiting it to about 30 or 40 vehicles. The reenactment of the original drive would begin at approximately 8 a.m., 10 miles south of Crystal City at the U.S. border and ending at Brandon. Two different routes are currently being planned, one that follows the original route, which includes some gravel roads, and another that will be strictly paved roads. The Relic Run Committee has also proposed that participants make stops at some museums along the route to break up the driving and give the Relic Runners an opportunity to explore some of the history available at each of the stops. There's an old Icelandic church near Glenborough that we're looking to stop at, as well as the last running ferry in Manitoba. This is the Stockton Ferry, which crosses the Assiniboine, said Melvin. He also added, we will also be doing some drone video and photos done professionally for safekeeping. That will be quite something. Anyone wishing to find out more may contact Alan Melvin at 204-529-2104 or AK Melvin at gmail.com or contact Gordon Goldsboro via gordon at mhs.mb.ca. The Sunshine Highway Relic Run Committee is also asking any individuals with stories or memorabilia of the Sunshine Highway to reach out. Any potential changes may be found on the group's website, which is www.sunshinehighway1921.ca Well, that sounds interesting. Now there's an announcement here that I'll talk about. Um, it's going to be held in at the Carberry Collegiate in Carberry, Manitoba. It's called Path for Today, a free community wellness event held April the 23rd, 2024, featuring keynote presenter Chris Beaudry, a former assistant coach of the Humboldt Broncos and mental health advocate. 
Chris's life changed on the day of the Humboldt Broncos 2017-18 bus crash. Since then, Chris has been very involved in the field of mental health and healing. Chris will share his story and journey. His talk explores the human spirit's capacity to overcome adversity and foster growth even when in the face of tragedy. It takes courage and vulnerability to discover what path is the right one for today. Discovering and rediscovering what works for today, not tomorrow or yesterday, is an important wellness practice we can build from. There will be breakout sessions. So mark your calendar for April 23rd, 2024 at the Carberry Collegiate. Doors open at six o'clock and the fair, wellness fair will be at six o'clock also. Keynote speaker will be at seven o'clock with breakout sessions to follow, which are optional. Very good. All right, I'm going to skip over to Helen Drysdale's um, article today on Mediterranean biscuits. Well, my scheduled ramblings and recipe for this week are on hold for another week or two. Before I could send my recipe in, I was scammed. Doing research, my computer locked. Sadly, I allowed haste to cloud my better judgment. A sign from Microsoft said, your computer has been locked due to a virus. Please phone this number and a technician will help you. They do this to try and scare you into calling the listed number to receive support. If you call these phone numbers, scammers will ask you to install a program that gives them remote access to your computer. Using remote access, these experienced scammers rely on smooth talking to gain your trust and then they'll try to steal your data so they can access everything from your personal information to your banking details in an attempt to commit fraud. Please do not do what I did. Shut your computer down and do not phone the shysters. As I was suspicious with the technician, I hung up and called my computer savvy son who came to my rescue. Thank you, James. So until my computer comes back from the computer doctor, this is my rambling for this week. And I do hope you are now more informed than I was. I love all the vibrant flavors of Mediterranean dishes. This Mediterranean biscuit recipe comes together very quickly and goes well with the salad for lunch. I usually do not have sun-dried tomatoes on hand, so I just leave them out. On occasion, I have substituted chopped black olives instead. They still are great without the tomatoes or the olives. So she has a, um, a recipe for that, which you can find online. Now we have a picture of the newest hotel that is um, still being um, built. It's the Best Western Plus Hotel, currently under construction in Nipua. It has started to take shape. The wall structure went up recently on the southern portion of the former CN property. The property size was around 217,000 square feet with the original building design developed by Excel Engineering and featuring up to 67 rooms and a pool with a water slide. A convention center was planned to be added at a later date. More expansion details on the recent development will appear in an upcoming edition of the Banner and Press. Well, isn't that exciting? A pretty routine spring session for Nipua Town Council by Owen Devereaux. It was a brisk meeting of council for the town of Nipua on Tuesday, April the 2nd, as they had a relatively light agenda to attend to for the evening. A few of the notable topics discussed, however, included the following. Mayor Brian Headley thanked the students of Hazel M. Kellington School for his birthday card, which he recently received to assist him to celebrate the occasion. I think it was a milestone birthday. 
Headley also shared notification of recent meetings and discussions he had with Prairie Mountain Health and the Legion Ladies Auxiliary who had their district meeting on March 23rd. On March 22nd, Councillor Marika Kostinchuk met with the Home Assistance Nipwa and District, which is also known as HAND. She met with that committee and reported back that the number of participants in HAND's Community Meal Program is rising. For about three decades, the meal program has offered a feeling of connection to local seniors through a delicious home-cooked style meal. Last spring, it was expanded to include more delivery of meals directly to a variety of local senior residences. Councillor Jason Nadeau offered an update on a meeting with Westlake Employment Skills and Service and their efforts to expand their message of support to those residing in neighbouring regions. According to Nadeau, the Western Manitoba Regional Library Board has set its budget for the year and is keeping a close eye on the rise of minimum wage later this year. Meanwhile, an activity recently hosted by the Nipua Public Library was a stuffy sleepover. Stuffy sleepover. <laughs> Youngsters could leave their favorite stuffed animals at the library overnight for a sleepover and watch them on live stream on social media over the weekend. <laughs> the early bird winner for the Nipuan District Medical Clinic Farm and Leisure Lottery was announced as Councillor Murray Parrott, who is also a long-standing committee member and supporter of the clinic, congratulated Muriel Gammy on winning the prize. Muriel has been a longtime supporter of the clinic and an active volunteer in our community. Councillor Yvonne Sisley notified fellow council members that Rec Director Nicole Cooper has received a par participation grant of $1,000 that will be used for free session of aquafit and lap swim at the Nipua Pool. It will also go towards giving away free lessons for pickleball and frisbee golf. Manager of Operations Denny, Denny Sekwe notified Council that temporary pothole repair and steam clearing of drainage has been ongoing. There are many culverts across town and only one steamer, so Segue noted it's been a bit slow, but they've been getting all the areas cleared as quickly as possible. The wastewater treatment plant construction is still ongoing, with materials still arriving. The water and sewer project near the new hospital location are proceeding. Once those builds are both done, the tender for road construction will move ahead. Now we have a Rural Outlook page. Community Information Expo in Nipua. A one-stop community shop for various Local organizations and support groups was held at the Yellowhead Hall in Nipua on Tuesday, April the 9th. The Community Information Expo featured 26 booths, including the Nipua Newcomers Coat Room and Victoria's Quilt, shown in this picture. Books galore at Rotary Fundraiser. The Nipua Rotary Club's annual used book sale had plenty to offer this week from April the 8th to the 12th. The event was held in the former Chalet Carpets Building, located at the former Chalet Flooring Building. As can be seen above, there was quite the selection to choose from, with interested individuals taking their time to peruse the plethora of options on offer. So it's still there until, well, today, I guess, is the last day. All right, a look back and a look up at the eclipse of 1979. The last time Nipua was able to experience a solar eclipse was back on February 26, 1979. Here is some of the coverage of that event as it appeared in the pages of the Nipua Press. Hmm. These maps show that, that Nipua was almost at the exact center of the path for the solar eclipse. Uh, 
Nipua Carberry. Oh, here we are. Nipua, yeah, right there. So this is the path that it came. So they were right almost in the middle. Here's some people from that day. It was truly a once in a lifetime for most people of Nipua. <laughs> This story appeared on the front page of the Thursday, March 1st edition of the press, Nipua Press, back in 79. Ah, cool. So I read that already. Here we have Tenby Broomball Legend Gets Recognition. The 2024 Canadian National Broomball Championships were recently hosted in Portage La Prairie. Opening ceremonies featured a ball drop by Marty Clausen of Tenby, Manitoba to honour over 40 years of playing and coaching. Marty is still a very active force to be reckoned with on the ice and a major inspira inspiration to the generations he has helped lead from local play all the way to world championships. So here we have Marty's grandson, Shep Baker, Marty Clausen, and Shelby Defoe of Riding Mountain. Here we have Doug Galt, uh, a board member, uh, board member Ray Massanon, and Jody Byram, the MLA for Agassiz. Oh my goodness, look at all these pictures. These are the sports pages. Nipua Titans hand out their year-end awards. On Friday, April the 5th, the Nipua Titans held their year-end banquet at the Legion Hall in Nipua. During the event, the club handed out its awards for the 2023-24 MJHL season. Winners included are as follows. The High Life Foods Limited Hardest Worker Award was awarded to Connor Thompson. The Nipua Gladstone Co-op MVP Award went to Cody Gwinnison. The Harris Pharmacy Most Improved Player Award this year was shared as John Baird and Garrett McDonald were recognized. The Home Hardware Three Stars Award was given to Tim Taconic. The Bell MTS Unsung Hero Award was presented to Braden Knox. The Nipah Titans Alumni Top Defenseman Award was given to Awen Poye. Hayden Stocks was the leading scorer for the Nipah Titans with 47 points. 22 goals and 25 assists in 43 games. The Lionel Carruther Memorial Award was awarded to Connor Thompson. For the Camo Cattle Company Fans Choice Award, Cooper Kasprick received the honor. KC Cookett won the Rocky Mountain Equipment Rookie of the Year Award. Cody Gwinnison received both the Best Manitoba Born Player Award and the RBC Coaches Choice Awards. The Nipah Titans Year End Awards Banquet featured a couple of acknowledgments. First, Tannis Stewart was named the 2023-24 Gary Ridley Memorial Volunteer of the Year Award. As well, the Nipah Titans honored a pair of historic landmarks reached by head coach and general manager Ken Pearson. During the course of this past season, Pearson, who won, his, who won both his 600th MJHL win and 700th Junior A hockey victory. So congratulations, Kenny. Now on to Curling event winners for the 2024 Arden Mixed Curling Bonspiel. It was another massive, massively successful event in Arden, April 4th to 7th, as the Curling Club held its annual Mixed Curling Bonspiel. Each year, 
This event is an extremely popular spring feature for the community. This year's winning teams included the Plett Construction First Event Champions. From skip to lead, Frank Parada, Craig Henderson, Danielle Henderson, and Taylor Henderson, who defeated Matthew Kalbaki in the event final. The Napa Auto Parts Second Event Champions. From skip to lead, Jeff Early, Jodine Early, Ken Early, and Kennedy Manns. I think that's the other way around. They defeated Craig Johnson in the event final. The Nipua Gladstone Co-op third event champions. Janelle Locke, Eric Locke, Greg Smith, and Brandon Smith defeated Kevin Paramore in, Paramore in the event final. A huge thank you to all the volunteers, sponsors, and curlers that made the event and 2024 curling season, such a success in Arden. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm gonna read that. The Nipua uh, Banner and Press has opportunities for local journalism initiative reporters, or LJI reporters, who are willing to work from home on a freelance basis. So what does an LJI reporter do? They create new, original, local civic journalism. This is journalism that covers the activities of the country's civic institutions or subjects of public importance to society. The LJI story must be localized, showing the local impact to make it immediately relevant to the local community. Examples of civic institutions include, but are not limited to, courthouses, town halls, band councils, court, uh, sorry, school boards, hospitals, law enforcement agencies, courts, fire departments, crown corporations, government agencies, federal parliament or provincial legislatures. Journalistic quality of the work is important. Journalistic practices, ethics, and standards must be used in crafting the story. The purpose of the LJI is to inform citizens about local issues. LJI helps our publication in investigating and independently reporting on local issues. If you or someone you know would be interested in LJI reporting, please call Ken Waddell, publisher of Nipua Banner Press, at 204-476-3401 or email K Waddell, that's K-W-A-D-D-E-L-L at nipoabanner.com or drop in to see us at 423 Mountain Avenue in downtown Nipua between 8.30 a.m. and 4 p.m. All right, here we have an article about... Touchwood Park, Generosity and Support Shining Bright by Casper Werhan. Nipua's Touch, Touchwood Park received an overwhelming round of support for its accessible playground project on April the 3rd. From 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., Arts Forward hosted a fundraiser lunch in support of the organization's incentive with all proceeds benefiting the project. We were thrilled with the turnout. The community is amazing in showing support for fundraisers such as this one, and we are looking forward to doing more art opening slash fundraisers for other community organizations, said Yvonne Sisley of Arts Forward. These partnerships are so important, and we are happy to facilitate events like we did for Touchwood Park. It's part of giving back to our community, and one that is, is extremely important to myself and the board. The Touchwood Park Association commented on the event via a public statement saying the turnout for lunch and the opening of the Touchwood Park Artists Art Exhibit called Let Them Fly was fantastic. It truly showcased the incredible spirit of our community with everyone's generosity and support shining brightly. This day was also the opening of the Let Them Fly Exhibit which 
features art made by Touchwood residents. The artist and their instructor, Jerry Oliver, were on the scene to chat with all who wished to become acquainted and learn more. Some of the featured art was also on tour with the annual juried art show. These skilled individuals have been highlighted in prior editions of the Banner Press, such as in the October 6, 2023 article titled, It Was Nerve Wracking to Be That Famous, which highlighted their gala evening at Brandon. At the time, their works were on display at the Art Gallery of Southwestern Manitoba. This article is entitled, This is Such a Good Cause. Farm and Leisure Lotto's 2024 Early Bird Draw winner announced. The Farm and Leisure Lotto's Early Bird winner claimed their prize recently. Declared the winner on March 25th, the lucky winning ticket number was 970, belonging to Muriel Gammy of Nipah. She chose the $12,000 Enns Brothers voucher option as her prize. Gammy, uh, pictured here, met with Lottery Chair member Mary Ellen Clark here, and Enns Brothers representative Justin Pollock, who is the branch manager, and Ernie Kaharski, who is the turf and recreation sales. Um, this was April the 5th for the official presentation. Gammy said, this is my first time winning the lottery. I don't normally participate in lotteries because I don't believe in them, but this is such a good cause. And the equipment, this tractor, will be used for our local trails, such as the cross-country ski trails. Gammy added, thank you to John Deere, Enns Brothers, for their support of the lottery and to the lottery committee. Mary Ellen Clark also shared a comment on behalf of the lottery committee, stating, we're very happy to see a local winner and see it go back into the community in this way. Gammy is well known in Nipua and area for her involvement in groups such as the Cross Country Ski Club and the maintenance of area walking and ski trails. Wow. Spring is starting to spring up everywhere around the region. Here we have a beautiful picture. Spring is finally here and with it comes the spring melt. As the remaining snow and ice steadily continues to disappear, water once again begins to flow, trees bud with new life and grass and plants of splendid color begin to flourish. This photo was taken at McKinnon Creek on April the 3rd. Roxy Theatre celebrating National Canadian Film Day by Owen Devereaux. The Roxy Theatre is proud to be participating in a nationwide celebration of cinema. Nipois historic volunteer operated film and stage theatre is offering a free movie day on Wednesday, April 17th, as part of National Canadian Film Day. Roxy Board member Kate Jacks Jackman Atkinson said the event is held every spring as a means of encouraging Canadians to celebrate the incredible achievements of our nation's filmmakers. Basically, what this allows is for anyone in Canada to do a public performance of a Canadian movie without having to pay licensing fees. So that will allow us to actually show a movie for free, said Jackman McAckinson. We decided to show two movies. First, the film Ballerina at 5.30 p.m., which is an animated film aimed towards families. The other is Strange Brew at 7.30 p.m., which is a Canadian comedy classic. Concession will be open for regular purchases, but there is no admission cost. You can walk right in and see a movie. Ballerina is a 2016 animated film which takes place in 1880s France and follows an orphan girl who dreams of becoming a ballerina. Strange Brew is a 1983 Canadian comedy film 
starring the popular SCTV characters Bob and Doug McKenzie, portrayed by Dave Thomas and Rick Moranis. In 2023, the Globe and Mail named it as one of the 23 best Canadian comedy films ever made. Okay, we'll go back and read some of these articles. Uh, <laughs> Optimistic but longing for change, right in the middle, or right in the center by Ken Waddell. Disclaimer, the views expressed in this column are the writer's personal views and are not to be taken as being the view of the Banner and Press staff. As spring bursts forth with bright sunny days and fast running creeks, it's easy to become optimistic. That is in spite of all the problems we face. There is no doubt we have problems and some pretty big ones. Be it world, excuse me, be it worldly in nature or personal, there are always problems. In Canada, we definitely have a problem and that is with the attitude of our current federal government. I, I find it incredible that the federal Liberals can be so deaf and blind to the needs and mood of Canadians. The deafness and blindness regarding the carbon tax and then the whole climate change scenario seem puzzling to me. It can certainly be argued that the climate is changing, but I still doubt that curbing Canadians' activities will help. But there are bigger problems in my view. I think everyone knows we have a drug, crime and violence problem in Canada. The police know it, property and business owners know it, farmers know it too. The politicians know it, everybody knows there's a problem. But what to do about it? That should be reasonably simple. We need more mental health for help, for sure we do. We also need more policing, maybe even more jails, and we need a lot more courage in our leadership. It's all too common to read that offenses are being foisted on an innocent population by criminals who have records as long as your arm. Can anybody defend releasing known violent sex offenders back into the general public? They actually post notices that person B is being released into community C and is likely to reoffend. The reoffending may be murder or rape or other brutal actions. Are we out of our minds? Why is a known convicted person who's likely to reoffend ever being allowed to go free? They can be in custody, they can take college courses, they can become a writer or a musician or whatever, but they should never be out in the general public ever. I have long been a opposed to capital punishment, and I still am, but the way some criminals do not respond to treatment or jail time is enough to make a person question bringing back the death penalty. I am still opposed to the death penalty for two reasons. One, there is always the chance of wrongful conviction, and that has happened all too often. The second reason is that the Bible clearly says, Thou shalt not murder. To me, murder is taking another human's life, and capital punishment is just that, taking another person's life. In my mind, as tempting as capital punishment is, the death penalty, because of the above two stated reasons, make it incumbent on a society to put convicted killers away forever, but not kill them. The federal government, as well as provincial and some municipal governments, are also having an awful time coping with housing. It's not much wonder. Housing is so expensive. Land acquisition is expensive. To fill all the jobs, we have welcomed many thousands of immigrants. To fill our colleges and universities, we have brought in many thousands of international students. In response to the refugee crisis, we have brought in thousands of refugees. These moves are all well and good, but where on earth did the governments ever figure where they were going to house all these extra people? It's not like you can live in a tent, at least not safely in Canada. So all of the above are problems, but they can be solved. 
I am optimistic, but to remain so will require a lot of changes. Next to Reed Friesen, entitled Travel Memories. It was a casual conversation about the value of a smile, a gift so easily given even to strangers followed by the gift of a smile used in a homily that caused me to reflect on a morning in Moscow, 2009. My younger sister and I were filling in time while our elder sister was at work and chose to wander a marketplace with which we were already familiar. Our heritage is European, and so we did not look unlike the others filling the market square. Their apparel was much like ours, and we felt like we fit right in. A young woman working a kiosk asked us where we were from. A little surprised, we asked why she would ask. Her reply remains with me today. Because you're smiling, nobody smiles around here. And that was years ago. How fortunate to live a life with reasons to smile and to smile openly and freely. We have all kinds of signs on hiking paths, highways, on public and private buildings, sign, sign, everywhere a sign. I'm actually old enough to remember the Burma shave signs lining the U.S. highways. For those not as old as me, these were a series of signs, each with a phrase that one could easily read while driving by that were advertisements. One of my favorites was the following, cattle crossing, please drive slow, that old bull is some cow's bow. <laughs> or, my job is keeping faces clean and nobody knows the stubble I've seen. <laughs> As you drove the distance, you were entertained and informed by the wonders of Burma Shave. First trip to Australia, we were hiking and the warning sign with the image was Snake Crossing. Once again, I give thanks that I live in an area that has no need to post such a sign. Iceland 2017. We had spent time in the fabled Blue Lagoon worth every penny. We joined the Golden Circle Tour of glaciers, geysers, falls, and lava fields. At one of the geysers, there was a sign reminding us that the temperature of the water, up to 100 degrees Celsius, and the distance to the nearest hospital, approximately 40 minutes, and the recommendation to stay well back from the eruption. The geyser, Stroker, erupts blasting water to heights of around 15 to 20 meters every 5 to 10 minutes, although it is known to reach up to 40 meters. Again, lovely to look at, don't need it in my backyard. Then Malaysia 2004, a small tour boat on a canal near a city. The canal was crowded with market boats selling fruits, vegetables, prepared foods and merchandise. The water appeared to be dark, murky and unclean and yet people were casually bathing in it, brushing their teeth in it with it, washing their clothes and dishes in it. It was a bit disquieting for me, so accustomed to privacy for personal hygiene and clean, safe water for washing clothes and dishes, not to mention myself. So thankful for the many things I take for granted. Travel is a wonderful opportunity to learn more of life and living. For me, travel provides the opportunity to be doubly thankful for all that I already have. Don't lose hope. Faithfully yours, Neil Strohshine. I will never forget those monthly visits as long as I live. They happened on a Thursday night. My destination was the Salvation Army's Harbour Light Centre in Prince George, BC. It was a residential treatment centre for people struggling with alcoholism and drug addiction, but it was also church home for many of those who lived in Prince George's inner city. Services were held three nights a week, followed by a lunch that featured huge bowls of some of the thickest and heartiest soups I have ever eaten. Those who attended the services loved to sing. Their favourite song was One Day at a Time. 
Judging by the passion in their singing and the looks on their faces, I knew they were making powerful statements of faith. One day at a time, sweet Jesus. This is what they would sing. That's all I'm asking from you. That was all they wanted, one more day of life and the courage and strength to get through it. After one of those visits, a member of my family visiting from out of province asked me if there was any hope that those in treatment could break free of their addictions. I had never been asked that question before, so I didn't have an instant answer. After thinking for a few minutes, I replied, as long as there is a God in heaven who works miracles, there is hope for everyone. My belief in the truth of those words is far stronger today than it's ever been. The dictionary defines hope as a feeling of expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen. Many mental health professionals hold hope to be an indispensable key to happiness and believe people cannot be happy without hope. That's a Wiki Wikipedia quote. In my lifetime, I have known periods of intense loneliness. I know how it feels to be alone, a small island in a sea of humanity. I know how it feels to be helpless, to have my world fall to pieces around me and be unable to do anything about it. I know of many others who have felt the same way. But as bad as things were, none of us ever lost hope. We knew we were in good company. The list of people with whom we shared similar experiences included the prophets Elijah and Jeremiah, and one of ancient Israel's greatest leaders, King David. David knew how it felt to be caught in a scandal of his own making. He knew how it felt to be rejected by his own family and to be forced to run for his life while his son took over as king and tried to have his father arrested and killed. In one of the lowest periods of his life, he wrote these words, Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God for... I shall again praise him, my help and my God. Psalm 42, verses 5 and 6. In a world where everything is constantly changing, our God remains forever the same. I am the Lord, he says, I change not. Malachi 3, verse 6. God is not subject to human whims or wishes. He governs the universe using laws that he put in place long before humans ever set foot on this planet. Our hope for a better world with a better future for all can only be realized as we put our faith in him. A good place to begin is to start living like my friends from Harbor Light Prince George lived. Take life one day at a time. All right, I guess I will read there's just a couple of things left. Gladstone Cattle Market Report by Tyler Slowinski of the Gladstone Auction. Whatever frost there was is disappearing. Pens are getting soft. Heavy equipment and higher concentrations of livestock make it tough to keep pens clean, not to mention the ruts that are left wherever you go. Spring is definitely in the air and the countdown to moving cattle to grass is on. The market this week trended with mixed feelings. The futures were green, yet lower to start things off on the feeder cattle this week, mainly due to softer futures on the finished cattle. Replacement quality heifers and lighter cattle still haven't shown much weakness. The trim market, which your cows and bulls fit into, is at an all-time high. The cow and bull market hasn't given any indication of softening just yet, especially with the grilling season starting now. <laughs> Supply and demand is definitely supporting the cattle market at this time. We sold 1,128 cattle through the ring in Gladstone. The market saw a variety of cattle. The market seemed softer in most spots, but was fairly steady for the most part. 
The first cut cattle are becoming few and far between and are still in high demand. Second and third cut cattle are definitely showing signs of pressure, but are still bringing plenty more than they did one year ago. Cows and bulls traded with plenty of strength from 150 to 165, with sales to 170 showing stronger averages. Bulls traded with strength ranging between 188 to 202. All classes of cattle sold well. Planer type cattle are still being discounted. Okay. Did that. Just checking what else. Okay, so the last thing is I am looking back. But first I'll just mention what's on at the Roxy Theatre this weekend. April 12th and 13th, 12th and 13th the movie called Ghostbusters Frozen Empire is showing at 7.30. When the discovery of an ancient artifact unleashes an evil force, Ghostbusters new and old must join forces to protect their home and save the world from a second ice age. Rated PG. Hmm. I think this probably means the weekend after. The show is entitled One Life. All right, looking back. Hmm, 74. There's a picture of a, a local fellow from back in the day, John Zeke. Captain of the Nipua Bantam A team received the Cardale Motors Trophy, emblematic of the Midwest League Championship, from League Representative Mac Buchanan of Shoal Lake in 1974. 50 years ago. <laughs> so, 125 years ago, May 1899. Secretary Wemyss of the Agricultural Society has been very successful in his canvassing for advertising for the Society's prize list to be issued early next month. 100 years ago, April 11th, 1924. 100 years ago, it's crazy. Are we to have a pig club? You bet we are. Our rural boys and girls are going to show that neither hail, frost, rust, drought, nor financial frauds can cramp their lives. Experience has taught a few lessons from the elders, which the elders are in duty bound to inculcate in the minds of youth and cooperate in demonstrations of truth. A pig club is one way of starting the young people on the right track. Okay. 75 years ago, April 14, 1949, Kirstine Robertson, 77 years, wife of Robert Robertson, died at her home in the Brandon District on Thursday, April 7th, born in Denmark in 1871. Mrs. Robertson came to Canada in 1894, residing in the Oberon district until nine years ago when they moved to the Brandon district. In Franklin, a bee was held on Friday at the hall to prepare the stage, etc., for Dark Time Follies, which was to present it this week on Tuesday night. 50 years ago, April 11, 1974, Canada Manpower Centre at Portage La Prairie announced this week that they will open a branch office in Nipua next week, which will be managed by Percy Murray, former proprietor of Nipua Truck Service. The office will be located in the Smith Block, just east of the municipal building, formerly occupied by the agricultural representative. Shulman, who has operated the 
economy department store at the corner of Hamilton Street and Mountain Avenue for the past 30 years announced this week he has sold his interests to David Jurundson, a businessman from Winnipeg. The change became effective April 1st. And in Plumas, Mr. and Mrs. Ed Oswald of Plumas and their daughter and son-in-law, Beverly and Brent Hicks, went to Spain February 18th and report an exciting holiday. The highlight of their trip was a visit to Tan Tanger, Africa. 20 years ago, April 12, 2004. Beautiful Plains School Division is still waiting to hear if the province will fund the construction of a new collegiate in Carberry. Hmm. Anyways, that, that seems to be it for this week's edition of the Nipah Banner and Press. So thank you for joining us and hopefully we'll see you another week. So goodbye for now.